to Musical Journeys number 27 on Final Resonance TV today with my good buddy from Austin, Texas, AJ Vallejo. What up? And AJ is a three-time producer of the year in Austin, and he is also a 30-year frontman of Vallejo. Most people know that. And then he's got a new project called Brody Lane, which you're going to tell me, yeah. about, tell me about today. You know, when we went back to, you know, I was just seeing that Carol Marshall comment on your uh, post and Carol's Carol's brother and I were really close wow <laughs> he went to high school with me so anyway did you guys live over there by you lived in Indian what was it right there so I, you so you went you went to Carol's house right you've been you've been sure been I used house. to go there all the time dude we lived so if, if, if you remember their driveway we lived across the street from her that way there's a road there and it went that way and then that road took you to Pelham High School yeah we lived on literally across the street from her and we'd go play basketball with her and i mean i'm just saying like she was always just a kind of like a skinny straight pretty <laughs> she was always pretty but then that one summer when they kind of all fill out right. and we showed up to the bus stop and we were like whoa <laughs> whoa so i mean you guys went that, to that, yeah you guys that, went to uh, after that summer everybody had a crush on carol so yeah she's a pretty girl very pretty girl very pretty girl <laughs> yeah man we slipped we, we it's crazy because we didn't go we we didn't go to Pelham. We went to uh, we went to River Chase, and uh, we went there for a while. And uh, it's funny because I you know I was every time I see you know, oh Sweeney and Clemson, and I'm like man he used to sit he used to sit in front of me because you know Sweeney Vallejo, right. yeah, you know everything was alphabetized. He'd always sit in front of me. They were always cool. Trip was cool, but uh, yeah. Then we, when we went to high school, my dad moved us out to uh, Columbiana out there. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so then we moved over. Uh, you know, the, the district was Thompson, so we went to Thompson. You know, yeah, I was, going to lot. I was wondering how you, you know, the, the, the was it Indian Hills or what was it called? Yeah, uh, so, I think it was called Indian Hills. That's been it's been a minute. Uh, yeah, right. But, right. You, but you know the street. We, we've 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 all we we wreaked havoc on those and the streets. I'm sure y'all did too. <laughs> well, you know, what? Done, we, a lot I, of stuff there. It's funny because my bass player lived down the street from there. I mean, literally yeah. like a block from you. And uh, so I was always over in that neighborhood. All you remember the dirt tracks out there in the open fields, oh, yeah. the BMX uh -huh. tracks. I'd be out there oh, riding yeah, we, with it. Yeah, we'd all go out there. So that's weird. I never ran across you before that. That's weird. We we actually ran into each other when we started playing, and then I think you guys mostly uh, y'all were working at uh, Music Alley. Was it? Yeah. Was it, that was called Music Alley? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Music Alley. Y'all had all the cool gear. No, that was where that was the place to go. I think there was one or two other places, but y'all had all the. Latest and greatest, and I know Jamie was a big gear nerd, and all, all you guys, and y'all, man, check out this guitar. And then we all, I'd always remember, like, you'd work there, and like, yeah, I'd walk in, and you'd be just shredding. I'd be like, dude, that guy's <laughs> Well, it's funny, you know, let's go back, go back, though, to, I mean, did you, were you born in Alabama? Uh, no, actually, that's why, that's, now everybody asks, like, well, what y'all, what, what, you know, what brought y'all to Texas? You know, we were born in El Campo, Texas, a little, little, uh, little rice town, cotton rice town, but, 50 miles south of Houston, Texas. So it's right there on the on the on the east side of Texas. Uh, we were born there, and then around like we were like nine or ten, my dad. It was all you know. My dad was transferring a lot because he's a uh, he's in the culinary, you know, business. And we actually moved to Brunswick, Georgia, for about a year, and then we just kept having to move. We had an aunt and uncle that lived in Birmingham, and we kept having every time a hurricane came, we had to go stay with them. And my dad was like, "Screw this! I'm tired of this." So. My dad, uh, my, my dad always had a dream of, of living on a farm because he was raised on a farm, which we hated. My mom hated. I think she was about to leave him. But uh, <laughs> he buys this farm out in the middle of nowhere, out in Columbia, Columbiana, out, uh, in Saluria or something. And, uh, man, we drove up to it. It was, like, dilapidated. I mean, he's like, we're going to fix this thing up. And my mom was like, my mom went and stayed with her sister. was like, I'm leaving you. I'm not living <laughs> in that damn piece of shit. Like, like, you know, like, but, you know, in hindsight, you know, we hated my dad at the time, but we it taught us a lot. We built, you know, we built a garden, and we we, we we were my dad was green before green was cool. Like he was like, we're gonna we're gonna eat our own food, we're gonna have our own farm, you know, we're gonna re, we're gonna build everything and live off the land. And when you're when you're a teenager and you're like, all you want to do is go play Nintendo and Atari with your friends, like that was not the coolest thing. But you know, right. but we did have a cool basement, and we made a cool basement, and we started getting in the band, and we started playing and. You know, then the, the basement, our basement is legendary for, you know, how Vallejo started and all that. Because so, that's just where we started, you know. So where did your music thing come from? Uh, my dad had, my dad had a dream. He wanted us to be, 
like Herb Alpert, he loved the Herb Alpert and the Tijuana, Tijuana Brass. So his dream was to have three trumpet, us uh, to play three trumpets. So he bought, he went and got a special deal on three trumpets. And, uh, you know, and he shows up with three trumpets and we're like, oh man, cause I want to, I, I mean, I wanted a guitar, you know, Alex wanted a drum kit. And, and we're like, again, my dad just did everything. He didn't really care what anybody thought. He just did whatever he wanted. So he shows up with these three trumpets. He's like, you know what, at least learn how to play music. And you guys can do it, you know, branch off from there. And, uh, you know, so we went and learned to play music. We got in band, got in marching band, got in all this stuff. Got in the jazz band, started realizing, you know, because uh, chart music's cool, but, like, with the jazz, we started, like, getting into the fact that you could kind of, like, improvise and get into stuff like that. So that was kind of where we got the bug as far as, like, you know, then while we were in that jazz band, we, you know, and obviously we discovered, you know, girls and <laughs> party and, and then they're, like, and uh, everybody's, you know, with that comes everybody's, you know, blasting Van Halen and Rat and, you know, you know, the doors and Led Zeppelin through their trucks. And that's kind of where we got the bug on that. And then we we're like, let's start our own band. And then we just started jamming in the basement. What's funny, like a lot of people, when Vallejo just showed up, you know, playing downtown, we were kind of really tight. And everybody was like, man, when this band get good, we weren't really always that tight. We, we honed and woodshedded for like a year or two in our basement out in Columbiana before anybody heard us. Only our girlfriends heard us. So that's why when everybody's like, you're great, they would roll their eyes because they're like, no, at one time they truly sucked balls. They really did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a funny story behind like the uh, whole thing where, uh, you know, when the Panda Bang Wangas was playing with Vallejo, I don't know if you really realize this, but we were doing the same thing as you guys were. We were like woodshedding for like a year and a half. Yeah. And what happened was, we couldn't get it. We got one gig, and we couldn't get any other damn gigs. We were just sitting there. Yeah. And we, we broke the damn band up, right? Yeah. Because after a year and a half, we're like, this is not going anywhere. And then <laughs> you guys, you guys called us up and said, hey, we need y'all to come play, or would you come play this gig with us? Yeah, I and remember it, that. It was at Faces <laughs> Deli. And dude, I, dude, I think I have that flyer. <laughs> I meant to dig it up, and it's, it's somewhere in my attic. Yeah. I have the flyer where we hand wrote it and it has the Panda Band Wangas on there. But, but I don't know. If, and, and, and Dave, we all we have separate stories, but they're similar. You know, uh, we did, if my memory serves me correct, we tried Dave out to sing. And I think he even maybe did a few gigs. And I don't know what happened. We, yeah. I don't know if he was ever officially in the band. We were trying numerous singers out. Right. And then uh, he might have done a gig or two with us. I can't remember. He might be able to tell you that if we did. But, yeah. but we did one thing we did do is we jammed a lot he'd come over to our house a lot oh yeah and uh we really loved him we thought he was a great singer he had massive range we're like man he can sing all that high priest and all that, you know anything if it's high yeah and then uh and then i think for whatever reason it didn't work out or i think he said man i'm starting to jam with these guys some of the guys was relics after or before panda after after okay yeah that's what i think he said i'm jamming with some of the relics guys and then uh and that's, that's where the gig came, because we were like, man, we need an opening band. So we were like, dude, let's call Dave up. I mean, hey, man, is that band, you got that, is that band good enough? Y'all are y'all good enough to play? Right, and he's right. like, yeah, yeah. We've been, so, we've been in, a, in a freaking storage bin for a year trying to get, <laughs> get a gig. <laughs> and then you called, and we were like, oh, we got a gig, and we are already broke up. We are like, shit, okay, we'll get back together for this. And then after that, <laughs> and then after that, dude, it started this roll with, with that band, and we never stopped until Relic started. Yeah. So there went a couple of years. So we owe you guys for the gigs. Well, man, I mean, it, it was, it was dude, I mean, it was mostly just going like, dude, let's get a killer band, and you know, that, that would be good, and perfect opener that plays the same stuff we play. Because right. I mean, you remember there was some cool bands. Uh, and everybody was doing their own thing, but it was really hard to find somebody that kind of mixed with us because we were, I mean, not that we were playing like the Latin stuff we later on went to play, but, yeah. you know, we, we, we went, back in the day, you had to be careful because if two bands played, a lot of us were playing the same song. So if you get the opening band and they play all all your hot songs, I mean, right, you're, they end with Crazy Train, where do you go from there? You're like, I'm fucked. <laughs> right. Like, I, I, spent, I spent a year working on Crazy Train. <laughs> I remember that about you guys when you were, uh, playing in the clubs you even had a girl sing with you on some stuff if I, if I yeah yeah shadow her name was shadow yeah was great. yeah we, you know we loved her she, she was she was good a lot of it was just the way and it's funny because a lot of people were like man you know everybody thinks or knows me as the lead singer of vallejo but what a lot of people don't know is i'm the sixth lead singer of vallejo like <laughs> just after a while we did nobody worked out and then my brothers we 
I'd, I'd sing during rehearsal, and then a, a bunch of gigs came up, and we were like, man, we're going to try this new guy out, and then, I think Omar got in a fight with him and kicked the, he kicked him out like the day before the gig. And I, and I was like, man, what, you just kicked him out. We got a gig tomorrow. And Omar was like, you're singing. And then I was like, cool, I'll sing until we find a new singer. And here, here we are 30 years later. We're still looking for a singer. We ain't found one. <laughs> it's hard, man. It's really hard. I've been looking hard and far and wide. And I found some, but, man, it took forever. <laughs> yeah, it takes forever, man, to find a good singer that you can kind of – enjoy playing with and just kind of feels you know is on the same page as you that likes the same things it's, it's like a relationship it's it's it really is so let's go from uh let's go from the early club days to when you started working on your first thing with mike penpento yeah <laughs> um this is a funny thing and i don't know if you remember this but you guys had called me up to come over and uh listen to the songs and development stuff you were doing and sort of semi offered me the job <laughs> yeah yeah do you remember this yeah, I do. I remember that, dude. We just like we just thought. I mean, you guys, y'all, and uh, you know Jamie, and uh, you know, and then of course Patrick. I mean, yeah. we just thought we thought the world of you guys. We were like, man, when he's we can, you know, we you know maybe we'll get as good as these guys. It was them, them and uh, of course Bruce's band. Before Bruce was in the band, we loved Kill Darling and Cashmere and whatever band he, yeah, Cashmere. whatever whatever and uh, nobody's fault whatever band he started that was named after Led Zeppelin song we, we, we thought those our guys were all cool you know? well this is a funny thing I got a picture in my my archive of Bruce playing with Cashmere at oh, really? uh, at uh, 2001 Teen Club you remember that place oh yeah all right so Bruce and them were playing on one stage and we were playing on the other one with my high school band which was called Midnight Sun. Uh-huh. And I happened to snap a picture that night, and it's Bruce Roman Glicks in the band. Yeah, from so Jackal. Right, or right. And we're all kids, man. And, uh, yeah, so it's kind of a weird thing. So tell me about how that whole thing developed with Mike after that point, and then you get a deal eventually. Go through that whole thing. Yeah, I mean, man, it was it was cool because they were having a battle of the bands. At, I forget the name of the place where they had it. It was somewhere out there in Hoover, but not Hoover. It was past like the Savy Hills area, and I forget the name of it. If we both said it, we'd know it. Right. Anyway, it was a big battle of bands, and uh, there was a bunch of bands. I mean, there was a uh, God. I forget the name of the bands, but like Slick Lily was in it, and was obviously favored to win, and they did really well. But uh, Mike Penapenta was one of the judges, and I, I, for some reason, we you know every gig is not killer, but we just nailed that set that night, and we ended up winning the battle of the bands. Yeah, and uh, the, I guess the, the the prize was you get to record it at Airwave, and you get to do three songs and produced by Pinto and yeah, uh, yeah, and that's how it started, man. And he, you know, he was like, he came down immediately and was like, dude, you guys are great. I've never heard of you guys. I freaking love you guys. I voted. I gave you a perfect score. I, I was like, I, I can tell the other judges like, I love Sick Lee and all, and they're cool and all, but like, this band needs to be, you know, we need to let me let me just. You know, let this band win so we can we can work with them. And yeah, well, he started. He really worked us. And then we were kind of a rock band. I mean, already kind of doing. You know, you saw you heard us kind of when we started out. We were doing. Sure. A, we were into Chili Peppers and Jane's Addiction, and we were a hodgepodge of Zeppelin and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. he's the guy that was like, man, you know, you guys should go back and instill some of your roots into the, your music. Like, you know, you know, you guys are Latinos, and your mom's Guatemalan, your dad's Mexican American. Like, you know. You like Santana? Oh yeah, we like all them. We heard my parents got those records. We we think it's cool, but we never really dug into it. You know, I was, you know, early on. I mean, I knew what we. My first records was Boston, <laughs> and, and, and you know, in a Queen play the game. I just thought those were like that. I mean, I was like, if it's not that, I don't want to hear it. So right. Uh, no, but you know, he started incorporating polyrhythms and Latin Afro Cuban rhythms mixing. And, he was like, and then we we're like, well, we don't really want to be, we don't want to be Latino. And he was like. No, because you can be rock like Aerosmith grew, but put a Afro-Cuban rhythm under it. And it was really cool because at first we were kind of like, mm. we just went with it because we were like, this guy has, you know, all these accolades. And But after about a month or so, there was a turning point where we went, this sounds, this is different. This is a sound. This is really cool. So, and, when we, and it came, it probably came with the song Classico. When Classico, when we played that back, we were like, okay, I think we might be onto some stuff. So yeah, ever since then, right. we kind of embraced it and. Then we went and got a deal uh, with IMI, and then we moved here to Austin. And like South by Southwest, we'd gotten signed. One of the guys that was sitting, uh, one of the big producers from uh, TVT Records, was sitting in the crowd and snatched us up. And then they signed us to Sony. So it's it was a 
it's a climb. You know, you go from indie and then they they start selling you off to, and then finally you end up on Sony, and that is a that is a crazy world. <laughs> Being on a major label is not fun. So it's tell me. So tell me about when you guys get to Sony and what 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 changes. Like you said, it's not fun. What what's what happens? Creative control is yeah. gone. It's gone. Yeah. Like you can, I mean, you are literally, you are literally basically whatever they think you, they whatever they think you should be. You know, and 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 it works for a lot of people. And I mean, and it, I think it would work for us if somebody at if our A and R guy or or, or or some of the people at the higher ups really knew what we were trying to do. You know, be and like. They didn't really see that. They just kind of saw us as kind of like, oh, they're good looking. They they're very talented. Let's let's go. Let's get them to open up for Disturb and Fuel. I mean, it's like that. Was, we were like, what are we doing here? Like, we got congas. There's people throwing. We're opening up for Disturb. People are throwing shoes and cans at us. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they they were. Just, I mean, it's, it sounds like yeah. I mean, you go in with this focused idea, right? Of, of, yeah. of something that you're you're working for a sound that you're that you're you're developed. Yeah, I mean, we had, I mean, Michael Barbiero produced our record. I mean, he did, yeah. you know, he, I mean, he, he, you know, everybody knows he's done GNR and Metallica. I mean, he's done all these great, great, huge records. And we thought, wow, this is cool, you know. But then he comes in. That's when I knew something was wrong because it was exciting that we, that they, you know, they're like, we're going to get, you know, we just think Michael Barbiero for your record slated to produce your album. I was like, wow, that's now, I was like, we're, we're, in, the, we're in the big time. That dude did Appetite for Destruction. I mean, it's like, right. so that was nerve wracking. But then, just the first meeting and first session, we'd had all these songs, and he was just started. He started just snatching up all the rock songs and songs that really weren't. I, I thought there was. There's a whole album of songs that I, that we all as a band, and even the A and R guy felt were more representative of what Vallejo. Which, if they would have bottled that the true Vallejo sound up and sold that and had success in it, we would be. We would be in another. There'd be something else to be happening. There'd, there'd be other bands maybe that were influenced that meant, and there are to a certain degree here on a small local level. But right. um, I think we would have seen we would have seen something else. But and it's okay. In hindsight, it's it made us really the business that me and my brothers are in now, where we are in the music business ourselves. It, in hindsight, it taught us a lot of how to like make sure you do you know you do everything yourself, and if you want to do it, get it done right. And then also just the artists that we work with. We don't. We try to like find out what they're really about instead of trying to make act like we know what they're about, and we just try to bring in out the best of them. So, yeah, it would have been great to like sell a gazillion records and make a bunch of money. Yeah, but like we're comfortable here and we're very happy. Like it taught us a lot on how to just like really protect the artist and really serve the artist and serve the song and you know all these things. Is you know you, you probably full well know yourself. Yeah. Based on what I see you're doing. So. Well, you know, it, yeah. There's that whole thing. I mean, I, you know, I have a lot of friends who've gone through the similar situations as you had, and, and you know, I have a girl that I worked with for a while. She was a the winner of Nashville Star. Yeah. And um, and she, you know, that was the same thing. They were trying to sell her as something that she didn't really. You know, they were having a hard time figuring out how they were going to sell her, and then you know when it came down to it. It was hard for her to feel it, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, that, a lot, that very similar story with you know Kendall, who I'm in lo the band Love and Chaos with. Yeah, she was in, on American Idol, and they tried to they tried to dress her up as the uh, as the girl next door. They put a little bow in her hair and got her to sing, you know, Sarah Evans songs and stuff. Like she was like, "No, man, I want to sing like I want to sing Joan Jett and Pat Benatar. I'm a rocker." And then they're like, "No, no, no, we got that girl. That if that's girl, that girl's scripted. You're this girl." And then, right, you know, from America, you know. The conservative crowd likes that, but it's not. It wasn't enough to like. They like the, you know, when it, they, you're looking for the American Idol, they like the edgier kind of artists. Uh, sure. I find they all win. So, right, so right. you know, case in point, how Adam Lambert was what much more edgier, much better singer than the other kid that I don't even know his name. Yeah, which makes sense. He was a safer American Idol, you know. Yeah, I, I, I don't think the world was ready for somebody as edgy and uh, you know, as different as Adam Lambert. Right, was. right, right. So he didn't win, but then here, here's the other guys. I don't. You can't pick, pick the guy with police lineup and Adam Lambert single with Queen. So <laughs> <laughs> right. right, but that's you know that's funny because I, I you know I don't know if you remember Mark uh, Barnett, but he was the singer in Twenty Four Carat. Yeah, man, I love that band. They were so good. Right. So he went through the whole same, similar situation, and they won this Rags the Richest thing, which is an MCA contract. But what he found out was that. Bon Jovi was on that same in that same competition a couple a year before, but they came in second. But it was on purpose because they could 
they could get a better deal. Yeah. By not being the winner because the winner got this other deal that yeah. wasn't the same kind of deal. That makes sense. <laughs> right? Yeah. Bon Jovi had made had parlayed that into a real real right. deal, right? That they yeah. could work with that actually had a contract that they could actually, you know, profit from. So yeah, yeah so was, I don't know if you're the girl you work with, if, if she was they did the same thing like with Kendall, she couldn't really do much of anything for like a year. So yeah. the, to all that stuff died down. Yep. I mean, they took over a website and all that. And then yeah. we were making a record the whole time. And the minute it cut off, then we released her album. But she couldn't release anything. Yeah, they were yeah. On, on that retainer for a while, right? Yeah. And exactly what happened. And it happened to another girl up here, uh, Shauna P., who was on The Voice. Mm. And she was wow. the, under the same little gag yeah. thing. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Yeah, it's amazing. So, so good. Real quick. Hey, yeah. will you go give me that. Go, go the LP. Go look at my albums and give me that that hotel album. Oh yeah, right. man. The hotel. I got a ho- dude. I, you got to see this. I I just uh, I found it online. Yeah, <laughs> it's the hotel. Found the hotel. <laughs> LP is perfect, dude. You saw I had Mark Mark on here, Mark Phillips. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did just see that. And then uh, Lee, is Lee still around? Lee Bargeron? Yeah, still he's around? still around. I think. Yeah, yeah. I talked a little the bit to those old guys, the guys that were you know my seniors at the time. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I love those guys. Oh, there it is. Shot. Yeah, dude, check this out. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can take it out of the plastic so it don't shine. Yeah, it's really awesome. Cool. Look at these guys. I know. Isn't that cool? That's so cool, dude. <laughs> I got I got a couple things in here too. I when you know when I had Damon on, Damon Johnson. Yeah, yeah. I went and bought that Delta Rebels album on vinyl. And yeah. it, was, it was also on another band called Witness before that. I bought that vinyl too just for the just to have it. Yeah, just this is archives, man. Oh, it's Birmingham history, you know. Right. We, I saw somebody posted something today or yesterday. I did not even know that Damon was for a minute in the damn Yankees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I I had heard that that record that that record that never got released was something to do with because uh, you know the, they submitted the album to the label and the label was like there's no singles on here and Ted told them to fuck off or rev off. I don't know if this is a family show. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry. but. laughs> okay. I put not for kids on the thing when I was. <laughs> Yeah, dude, so I think that's that's kind of why the record never got released or anything, because um, I think there was a Ted, you know, Ted being Ted, told them, you know, yeah, bite right. me, you know. Right, right, but, uh, sure. Yeah. I would like, I'm sure that record, I mean, apparently hadn't been released, but I would like to hear, you know, if Damon's on, it'd be cool, pretty cool, you know. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't I didn't even know Damon was in the Damon Yankees at one time. So. Yeah, he was, because uh, Tommy Shaw had to go back to Sticks. Oh. And they did the record, but Tommy was going to go back when Sticks got the name again, or he got some rights to the name. Yeah. He ended up going out on tour to keep that going. So that's why yeah. Damon came into it. But so, you know, let's go from, let's go a little bit through that period where you're signed and, and what happens to the trajectory of that. You go, what do you do? Or some of this touring that you did for that. And then, you know, kind of where how you ended up where you're, you know, doing all this now. Yeah. Well, I mean, dude, I mean, that's the crazy thing, whether, you know, and the record, I mean, on a major label uh, kind of standard, like the record sold somewhere around 250, 230, 40, something like that, thousand record. By by major label standards, that's not great because they right. want they want gold they want gold or platinum to keep you you know to keep you in a, as a priority. By any standards, that's phenomenal. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, so based off of that, based off of selling that many albums, we did build a huge fan base, and we've still played and. Even after we left Sony, um, but we, we were on Sony for about a good two or three years, two and a half years. Um, then the 9-11 thing happened, not to blame 9-11, but, you know, just for a while, people just weren't, it's kind of like now, people were just kind of kind of lost staring at their TVs, you know, so I don't think people were, they were playing, they wanted to play, like, they weren't having, they weren't like, you couldn't play Left the Bodies Hit the Floor on the radio anymore, you couldn't play Had a Bad Day by Fuel, and uh, so I think they were kind of doing more recurrent stuff, and everything kind of kind of just got real soft there and then they kind of just said hey man we don't really want to spend we don't want to exercise the next option we will because we love you guys we think you guys are great but we're probably just going to like just put it out and not promote it and we were like okay cool if we can if we can leave on that note that'd be great and they even gave us the album which ended up being black sky which we ended up releasing on our on our uh, which was is a crazy album if you go back and listen to it because we had been touring with all these hard rock bands, Fuel, Seven Dust, and Stir, that we had, and Stone Temple Pilots. They, I don't know why they had us on all these tours, which is great in hindsight because we got to tour with all these 
cool bands and play in front of these huge venues. I mean, playing from lots of people or tour bus doing the whole rock star thing. But um, that record has ended up being real heavy and uh, was kind of lost on you know even I, I think when we, even when we put it out ourselves, our fans they dig it, they like that album, but they know it's kind of like a a dark horse. It's kind of like a it's not Vallejo, it's very heavy. Mm-hmm. But we were just writing a record that because we knew that if we went to Sony, they're going to throw us back out on the road with those bands again. So we had to write a record that kind of like work with you know a tour like that because we, we couldn't open up for seven dust and open up with a, a santana groove you know what I mean? <laughs> right 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 so, the, 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 i mean love them, love it or hate it they will throw stuff at you <laughs> like, right. like we got we got a lot of that but um so yeah man then after we parted away with sony like we just kind of uh we were immediately we, we knew that we had a fan base that we could still it was bittersweet because we were like, man, you know, it was not embarrassing, but it was kind of like, you know, it, it felt, you know, everybody kind of knows in public that, you know, you're parted ways with your major label or, or got dropped or whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, publicly it's humiliating, but we weren't super humiliated because in Austin Powers way, we were like, we're single again. You know, it was <laughs> right, like, right. You know, like, and then we knew we had a, we knew we had a hardcore fan base and that we had built. So we were like, dude, we, and like I said, the creative control was so lost and so gone. All of a sudden, we had this opportunity, and we did have other indies and other labels going, "Hey, dude, we'll snatch you up in a heartbeat." We were like, "You know what? We are not interested at all. We'll start our own label. We'll start our own publishing company. We'll start our own licensing." Because we, we we saw all these moving parts happening while we were on major label. We you know we, we wine and dine and hung out. I saw how all the big agents worked and all the big licensing things worked. So we made relationships with all those guys. So we we're like, I'd call them and say, "Hey, man." We're not on Sony anymore, but can we? Would you still be interested in working with us, or you know, communicating with us? And they're like, "Oh, dude, we we work with artists. We don't work with the labels. We're we're, you know." So when they said that, it gave us the confidence to go. You know what? We, I think we can do this on our own. And so going back to indie standards, like being an indie, we released Stereo and ended up selling fifty thousand of those by ourselves. By indie standards, that's phenomenal. You know what I mean, right, right. So um, that kind of that gave us the income to, and, and we, we got kind of cocky because we had all this money. So we were like, dude, think about this. We were on Sony for three years. I never saw one dime. <laughs> right, right. One, we, I was in a bus the whole time. Killer, beautiful Van Hill bus playing in front of 30,000 people every night. I going crazy. Groupies everywhere. I can't even tell you. you know, like, I mean, it's, I mean, the, the madness, you know, and brother, we did, you know, brother Kane was there and all those bands were there along for the ride and, and you know you get this that's and that's the facade of this whole industry is they ply you with so much rock star amenities that like you forget that when you get home there's no money <laughs> right because they're, they're they're taking all the money but you're you're getting the treatment yeah you're like dude when I get, you're like, dude we're making hand when I get home I'm gonna be rich I'm gonna go buy me a house and buy me a damn car like no but, but right that yeah. bus, when it goes it drops you off dude you're like you sit at home you're like damn I'm broke. <laughs> Right. But, uh, so when your friends think you're loaded, dude, they're like, "Yeah, hey, you're a rock star." We see on MTV and all this, like, and it's not the case. And it's funny because, um, just ironically, like, we actually, and I, and I don't say rich like monetarily, but we became like business rich when we when BMG got launched, and we all of a sudden we got to ride that wave of just of the Sony, and and that's what I'm saying. We're thankful for Sony for. They did build us a national fan base that we could sure. continue, uh, you know, working on. And as as the years pass, you know, that's why we're all doing things and we're producing now. You know, reality is the years pass, our fans grow. They're you know they're not out in the clubs and they're not out, you know, scooping up music every time it comes out. They're they're raising kids and now you know at the ages we're at, all their kids are now like in high school and you know they, yeah. they got life. They got life happening. They're not like, dude, I'm gonna go. Oh, what time y'all play? Midnight? Yeah, dude, I'll be there. <laughs> dude, half my friends, they're like, dude, I'm nine and ten o'clock. I'm I'm in bed already. Like I'm out, dude. Like this is a this is a funny thing, dude. And this is it's so funny because you're talking about your, your you know your your the kids being a certain age, right? Yeah. So our keyboard player in Relics, his daughter, has now found the the Relics soundtrack, right? <laughs> and she is. She's hitting me up for all of it, bro. She wants to know all about it. She wants to know everything <laughs> there. She's 23. And That's it's awesome. killing me. I'm like, you really want all this stuff? She's like, so awesome. I was like, well, 
I got a CD somewhere. I'll dig it up and I'll send you a copy. You can listen yeah, to all that's awesome, crazy man. stuff. That's, that's, that's great, you know, because it is, you know, they, they, these kids grow up listening to these things. And I don't know if they necessarily, it's not like we're force feeding them, but they, but they just grow up and they, they hear it on the radio and they, you know, they see it in commercials. And, you know, now we got rat selling Geico. And you know, it's like, right, right. That's, that's funny. You say that because <laughs> yeah. last night we were flight, we were rehearsing last night and we, yeah. uh, we, were, we were rehearsing round and round, right? Yeah, and the two girls in the band, one's thirty-five and one's twenty-four, and they yeah. said afterwards, the only reason we know that song is from the Geico commercial. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You probably know this, but that that song re-entered the Billboard chart. Yeah, it's, I heard that. It's insane. Like yeah. <laughs> that's wild, right? <laughs> yeah, dude, that's crazy. That's yeah, man. But going back to, I guess the whole thing is, you know, we still put out music, and obviously, we never saw, you know, the climate of, you know. Streaming, I mean, Napster was kind of a, a foresight of kind of um, where things were headed, you know, like where, and then I think it was because, you know, labels were greedy and they, they were charging people $17, 18 for an album and putting two hit songs on it and, you know, filling it with a bunch of crap and just, you know, like, I think, I think the, you know, the c consumer kind of got tired of that and then Napster showed up and was kind of like, you know what, I just want to go pick the songs that I like that are good and maybe we thought, okay, now we're going to, you know, then Apple shows up and go, okay, you want to pick your own songs, you still got to pay for them, they're only 99 cents. Right. Oh, there's a call coming in. Uh, they're only 99 cents, and uh, so that that, that happened. <coughs> right. and, um, hey, Terry, will you text Bree and tell her, I'll call her back. Yeah. Um, I'm on a team. Uh, it's one of my artists. But, uh, so, uh, yeah, so then, then we get, then streaming shows up, you know, Spotify, and it's like, Hey, here's a platform. We don't pay for hey, you pay a service. You pay Spotify a monthly service right. so that they can pay artists, you know, just <laughs> right. zero, zero, bunch of zeros, you know? Right, right. But um, I think like Pharrell's um, I'm So Happy got like a billion views and they sent him a $7,000 check. Yeah, like, I remember dude, reading that. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, so that happened. So here we are in a new climate that we never predicted. As we never predicted, here we are in another climate of life with the pandemic and all that. Just life is crazy. But here, as far as music, consumer music and the way it's consumed and, and bought by people, it's, uh, you know, now it's no longer the main monetary. You can't really monetize off it the way you used to. So now you have to figure out other ways to monetize, which is through licensing. And, um, you know, and licensing is the biggest one. But, uh, you know, then obviously merchandise and, you know, and then still you can't take away live music. You know, you can still charge for live music and bands get paid. But as far as uh, recorded music, I think we're uh, we're just in we're in a new climate of where it's more just kind of unfortunately kind of what people it's 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 almost like a commercial selling point just like just like a company spends money for a jingle, uh, you know they they go to a jingle company and here here's five thousand dollars make us a jingle so we can play it on the air to get people to buy our product and sure. that's kind of what it is. I hate to say it like that, but that's kind of what I've seen even working. I work for a label now at head of A&R at 10X. They're a natural label, and uh, that's kind of what these are the meetings that we have. The meeting I just, you know, I was when I was a little late today. Mm -hmm. I was on a Zoom meeting with a with a Spotify influencer and a and a and a, another uh, publicist, and it's these meetings are it's not the meetings are are unfortunately not. Hey, how can we make this person a star? The meeting is now without even talking about the, the artist going. How do we take this uh, artist we just signed and not one not only monetize them off of them as a label but monetize for them so that because if they don't make money we don't make money so um in in a demographic that doesn't you know that it's hard to monetize off of because everybody now has gotten acclimated to uh not paying for anything sure <laughs> sure so so, so here we are <laughs> so when you, you're talking about the main sources of income, I mean, there's a lot, I guess, new streams of income, you know, like even, um, you know, what, what we're doing here, you know, these kind of Absolutely. shows and these kind of um, um, performances, yeah, media or live performances. I mean, some people are doing live streams now and charging for them. Yeah. Dude, so, I, dude, I got to say, nobody's doing it bigger <laughs> than the Rock Revival here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. I don't know if you know, dude, when I, when I play that on my, I got a big screen TV in there and a stereo, I rock that stuff, like, it's like, dude, it's like a full-blown concert, dude, like, it oh, sounds you, good, it's you, killer, man. You know why that, you know why the, uh, you know how those, all that lighting stuff came together on that one we did? Remember the band 4AM? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, Earl Baumgartner, that's his place. 
Oh, wow. And Earl has this giant warehouse down behind a store that he owns. And yeah. that's that's like his playroom. <laughs> wow. I was wondering, like, man, I was like, how, did these guys, like, are this, are y'all, I mean, y'all just got a buddy at a club or something? It's like, how do y'all... No, it's not even a club, man. It's in the back of a building back down in the, in, in Montgomery. <laughs> Dude, I mean, if that if if I had a room like that here in Austin, I I could charge bands because I mean to to show. I mean, that might be something you get into, like because the, the, it's the way the, the way it's represented is so it's so well and visually it's great and it's that's the one thing. And you know, I do streams here and there. Like I'll go play my guitar, or, or we have friends, especially Austin. There's a a lot of this this is such a music town. A lot of my fellow friends are. That's all they did is play music. They played music four or five nights a week. Sure. So when you shut that down here in Austin right now, we've been like we talked about earlier. We've been very bad here. We're bad kids. We're in we're in timeout big time. They right. shut the clubs down. Uh, they shut the restaurant. Everything's shut down here. So having said that, if you're an artist and you work four or five days a week and that's your only means of income, you are out of work right now. So sure. Um, you know. The streams are cool, but man, it, it, as much as you love them, and I try to catch as many as I can or, or support a lot of my friends. But it, it just, it just, no matter what anybody says, it does not replace the sure, live experience. Sure, you know? yeah. And we're what still... you guys are doing, what you guys are doing with the sound and the PA and running, I mean, it sounds killer and it's all mixed. Like that's about the closest that you get to live, and I would love to see that. Like as I'm saying, if, if, if there was something like that here in Austin. It would it would do it would do really well. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it, it was a different situation. I mean, you know, we were playing to ten people or something in, in a big giant room, and you know, dude, I would give anything for just two people to clap back at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. like, my, 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 instead of my kids going, "Daddy, you're too loud. Can you stop playing?" Right. I'm trying to watch Rugrats. Yeah, you know, we're on the verge of a, uh, you know, we went to full mask today, and, and uh, so we don't know how long they're going to be before they cl- shut us back down. We don't, we don't know whether yeah. they're going to or they're not, but we are still playing. It's, you know, the, the attendance is down, of course, but uh, yeah. but there has been enough attendance to p- pay us. Yeah, well, that's better than what's going on here. Where there's no attendance. <laughs> no, right. no, no, so we're no, hanging. No we're hanging on the edge right now, bro. We're, we're hoping it don't go back, but uh, hopefully yeah. we won't. But so you know, you you go through all this, and then you get back to um, you end up in Austin again. Because when I, you know, when did you make that transition to move there? I forget when this happened. Uh, oh yeah, we moved here in '97. Okay. Uh, n- actually '96. When I say 96, we came here to look for a house. Omar and I came here to look for a house uh, late 96. And then we took new, uh, we th- then we went back and we had a game plan. Bruce and all them were back home. We and Omar go, we find a house. I put down a little hole deposit on this house. And this is the house. I bought this house. Uh, uh, I've been living here ever since. Uh, we took we played one gig at Louie Louie's. We we're like, we're going to play our New Year's gig at Louie Louie's. We take all that money. We made a bunch of money. I think we charged like $25, $20. And that's a lot even back then. Sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we walked out there with close to ten grand, and like, and, what, and, the, and the plan was I'm going to take 6000 of that and put it down for six months of rent on the house, which gives us six months to get you know, our shit together and, like, basically, like, you know, go get gigs and start making. In six months, we should be making money, whether that's we all have day jobs or we, we're playing. And then, in and the blessing is South by Southwest was in March. So here, here we moved in January. Here we moved here January seventh. So by March the eighteenth or twentieth, South by Southwest comes. There's a guy sitting in the crowd. We get snatched up, you know, and we're everything was beautiful. So right, right. You know, your income it, starts it, coming in. You're covered. It was, it, you know, in, in hindsight, it was a plan. You know, if we stayed in Birmingham, that didn't mean we wouldn't have got signed or something. But the plan that that we had is that that was the plan that we were going to come to Austin and get signed, and, and it, it it happened in three months. So, wow, you know, so we, we're we're thank we're thankful for that. You know, it didn't turn out as great as we wanted to, um, but it's a great learning experience, and I, I don't have any regrets being on Sony. I, I learned a lot, and sure. they were cool, you know. Sure. It was cool. So you so. you transitioned that into the production side of it. Um, yeah. So tell me about your trajectory into that from from your deal and all that. Well, yeah. I mean, so a, a lot of it came from stereo 
uh, Dwight Baker mixed that record. Carl Field did that record. Uh, they were these these guys are celebrated guys here in Austin. And, uh, he did a phenomenal job. And then then we started just recording our own stuff. And then Omar and I built a studio in his house upstairs. Just a big mutt. We had all this gear. <laughs> we put all this mutt crap. Like we put together this kind of mutt studio. But we were making some decent recordings so much that our friends were going, dude, that's that's cool. Uh, Where did you record that? Uh, up in my basement. So. Then we said, you know what, let's just make the next Vallejo record ourselves. And then we made it, and it sounded great, got good reviews. Then all of our friends here in Austin were like, hey, man, can you make my record sound like that? And we're like, yeah. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, Omar and I are in business. We start, uh, you know, we start mix, we start producing records together. We kind of want to be the next Lord Algies, you know. And then, like, then we started getting so much work that Omar started picking some things up. And, you know, I was doing kind of more pop, so I was picking up the pop stuff. Omar was doing the rock stuff. So then our schedules were kind of like overlapping and we were arguing about, you know, hey man, I'm recording Monday. No, I, I got to record Monday. So uh, so then we branched off and he got his studio and, and then I still work out of this one. I kind of built this one up and I do all, you know, like I said, I do all the big recording, the drums and all the big stuff at Omar Studio. He's got the big studio downtown mm-hmm. and uh, that's where he does his show out of 512. Mm-hmm. And then I do all my posts here, but I, like I said, all, all I do, uh, I do a lot of pop nashville's gone pop so i do a lot of pop work and uh you don't even need the big studio i do I, here on this side i got midi a lot of midi mm-hmm. a lot of stuff like that and uh, mm-hmm. so uh you know that's it's i've been doing this for now going on 10 years and won a couple of wars that helps that helps that helps get you better work so sure sure um and omar's gotten snatched up some couple awards as well so I, I'm, you know, if you're if you're in the producer world and you live in Austin, you probably don't like the Vallejo Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you're taking over. <laughs> yeah, I mean the last you know the last six years it's been me, that, me or Omar. So you know, but, well, you know, but, yeah. we're pr- we're proud of it. It's, it. It comes from hard work. It's, we're not sure. sitting here twiddling our thumbs. Sure. Like, you know, I do 30, 40 records a year. So yeah, well, he does know, he, he does probably as much or more. So you're, you're sort working. Of, you're sort of like me, you know, in in this market here. You know, I came here and. Once I dedicated myself full time back to music, man, I just the desperation aspect of it is like something that um, I, I had this interview with Joel Holkstra from White Snake, and the, the discussion was, you know, how do you stay so driven? And he said, desperation. <laughs> It's either this or or flipping burgers, baby. That's all I'm saying. So when you're looking at that in the face, people are going, why are you trying to take every gig in town? And that's not really what I'm trying to do, but I am trying to survive, you know, and there is is some desperate. That means taking every gig in town, and that's that's what you're doing. I mean, I'm working, man. Then add, dude, add two kids that you got to feed. I don't know where that damn food goes. They're like, they eat everything in the house. I can't, I mean, I'm like. I, I wanted to go get some fruit, and they ate all the fruit. Oh my god! I'm like, what do y'all? How do y'all? Where does it go? Because there are both bean poles. Like, I'm like, where, are y'all hiding food under the bed, or like, what? Daddy, y'all ain't leaving nothing for daddy. Like, I'm starving over here, dude. Look at right. me. I'm losing weight. <laughs> <laughs> it's am- it's amazing though, right? I mean, you know, yeah. th- there's a lot of there's a lot of um, negativity that comes from success, like you know, yeah. to- sometimes towards you, and it's like you there's, know, yeah, there's some haters, but it's cool. I mean. I- but yeah, I, there's, there's, you know, there's some people I hate on too, so because they're successful, and it's all good, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Well, you know, it's it's one of those things. I mean, it's a it's a drive thing, you know. Like when we were growing up in Birmingham, you know, there you couldn't help but kind of like get jealous of some of these bands that are kicking our asses. It's like shit. Yeah, you guys. Are I remember, killing. you know, everybody hated Brother Kane because they were the hot. You know, they were the they were the, they were the, you know they were Birmingham's boys, and I didn't hate them. I was like, they're all my friends. It's like. But I was kind of like, you know, you know, hey man, when are you gonna get us some opening slots? Oh man, you know, our label won't let us. Like bullshit. You can go in there and call them. Like, <laughs> you can tell them, you know, like we we tell everybody we open like we call the Panda Bang Wangas, dude. Like we can call whoever we want. Like you know, it's like <laughs> we and we still do. You know, we still, you know, if we like a band, you know, we we that's that, that's the one thing Vallejo's done in Texas. We've always tried to like you know help any any band anybody we thought was really great. We you know. We just wanted. We try to give them the same shot we wanted when we were young that nobody gave us. I mean, so sure. Well, I um, think that's you know when you think about you know uh, airwave guys, Penapento and Mark Phillips, and I mean I worked with Mark on a on a track one time when I was a kid. Of course, you know I, I was probably I didn't suck, but I you know probably wasn't like Lee Bargeron or you know yeah I wasn't like that kind of level. Those guys were like insane, you know. Multi instrumentalists, yeah. You walk in there and you feel like a little bitty, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'd be like, I play like this. I play like this terrible solo. I mean, I just really wasn't that great. I mean, I really wasn't like. Um, and I'd ask Lee, "Hey, man, what do you think?" And he'd be like, "That'll work. <laughs> That'll work." Is um, kind of me. That sucks, but it'll work. Like it's good enough for him. Like he'll, you know, he's because he would say maybe do it again, but like. That'll work I, for Lee Bergeron. I would take that. I mean, right. like, okay, if it works for Lee, I'm, it's good enough. <laughs> so, so tell me some. Tell me like a, a couple highlight stories of your uh, your ascent. <laughs> like people you met, something that blew your mind, anything that you think of that you just like. Just okay, dude. I, I just need to tell you one story, and I'll try to make it as quick as I can. All and right. based depending on who you tell the story, there's three people. There's, there, it's, it's, uh, there's, it's, it's, a, it's my story. It's a story about Slash, and, uh, and then myself, and then um, this lady, and I forget. I think her name is Sasha something or Bart. Her name is something Barton. Barton is her last name. She, she's a, she, she owns apparently owns Chikovsky's violin, and she has no legs. Maybe you've heard of her. I don't know. I haven't heard of her, but she's a, she's a classic violinist. She's very popular. You can Google her and all that. Yeah. I forget her name. I don't care because she doesn't like me anyway. So whatever. Like <laughs> so. We're playing at the House of Blues with Slash. It's it's Vallejo, Slash's, and it's before he had Miles Kennedy, who's one of my favorite singers ever. It was when he was doing Slash's Blues Ball, or whatever he was doing. It was before Snake Pit, or maybe after Snake Pit, Absolutely. in between. Yeah, after Snake Pit, yeah. And then Sammy Hagar was the headliner. Vallejo does their set. I go off stage. Slash's manager comes to me. Hey man, Slash wants to. He loved your set and wants to. Uh, he wants you to go down there and have a drink with him i go oh cool that's awesome like let me go get my brothers he goes no not your brother just you and i go uh, okay so we go down there and on the way down there he's asking me what's your relationship with your band and you know because slash is interested in maybe you trying out for his band i was like very flattered i go well those are my brothers he goes say no more we don't do that we don't be like we're not trying to do it we're not we don't we don't uh break families up <laughs> but stay down here let's come down here and uh you know watch uh we'll come down here and hang on slash and you know i'd let him know and slash was cool you know uh so we're down there slash is cool he's very nice like everybody always is they go crack open a big bottle of jack we pass it around in about five minutes we drink the whole fifth of jack there's other things going around of course um and uh so that happens so then his manager comes up and goes hey man there's this chick outside that wants to play uh, Chikovsky, she apparently she owns Tchaikovsky's violin, his violin. It's like 18 or whatever. Uh, and she wants to come in here and play a song for you. But before she comes in here, Slash is like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. He goes, but, but before she comes in here, like we, her manager, we we're like, whoa, her manager, she must be big time. Her manager wanted me to, I have to preface this story to you before they bring her in here. So anyway, supposedly she gets up, she has Tchaikovsky's violin. She's standing in the subway in New York, uh, Either between a, a thief tries to grab it or she gets stuck in the doorway of the subway and it tears her legs off or something, cool. some crazy stuff like that. Uh, and now the violin is now, the insurance is now valued at twice. It's now worth $22 million. It was, I think it was $10 million. Now it's worth $22 million. Lord. We're like, whoa, you can't make this shit up. So he, Slash is like, dude, bring her in. Of course, absolutely. So they bring her in. And this is, mind you, this is at the, at the uh, what do you call it? backstage at the house of blues in chicago they bring her in she's like they say they're nice guys and then she comes in and plays this beautiful piece by Tchaikovsky. and you know keep in mind we're all the, the jack's starting to kick in and everybody claps yeah they go crazy so of course they're standing over there taking pictures and she she like she's right there and i'm sitting right here and slash is here and she's right there she goes can you get a picture with slash can we get a picture with you not me but him Right. She puts the violin right there, right next to me. Like, it's right there. Like, they're taking pictures and stuff. I know I shouldn't. It was, it was like the Precious Ring on like Lord of the Rings, like Precious. Like, like I had to touch. <laughs> like, I knew I shouldn't have done anything, but for so, I kept looking at it, and I just, my drunk dumbass, I pick it up, and then I grab the bow. Nobody's paying attention. Nobody sees me doing this. They're over there taking pictures, signing autographs. I grab the bow and go, eh. Dude, everybody froze. There was like 20 people back there. <laughs> and slowly turns their head towards me. And I'm like, immediately I was like, oh, that was not a good idea. So two big security guards. One comes in front of me and there's one behind me. And one guy slowly grabs the violin. And in the minute it leaves my hands, the other guy just, yeah, like <laughs> yanks me out of there. They throw me down the stairs, dude. Like, I mean, like almost killed me. Like it hurt. It was like, blah, blah, like 14 flights. 
Like it hurt. I was so beat up. I couldn't even move. I, th- I think we had to cancel the gig the next day because I was so beat up from getting thrown down the stairs. Oh, and Lord. like I was flipping out. So I was like, that's a bad idea. I, I kind of come limping on the bus. My brother's like, where you been? I go, oh, never mind. I, didn't, I was too embarrassed <laughs> to tell it. Fast forward three years later, the Yellow Rose is a strip bar here in uh, Austin, Texas, slashed in there. And the owner's like, dude, and we're, we got our VIP table doing our Vallejo thing. And uh, owner goes, dude, Slash is over there, man. You want to say hey to him? I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm totally cool. I've, I've, we toured with him. I've met him many times. I'm good. So <laughs> he goes, okay, that's weird, whatever. So I run in the bathroom, and I, you know, wash my hands, and I come out the door. Boom. I bump into Slash, and I go, oh, man. He points at me and goes, Vallejo. <laughs> I was like, dude, I'm so sorry. I was like, I've been meaning to apologize to you, like write you or something. He goes, no, nah, dude, I tell that story to everybody. He goes, that story is hilarious. He goes, thank you for doing that. I go, I go, man, I'm so sorry, dude. I, I, I really am. But that's that's my that's my. I have many other ones, but that's the one that just like it's embarrassing, but it's hilarious as hell. So wow, that's crazy, dude. <laughs> wow, twenty two million dollar million. <laughs> Dude, it was it was it like it made it was like staring at it like there was an energy. I, I now whenever I watch that the ring like the precious my precious thing, I get I get what that I feel that I'm I'm like I've been there like the violin was like looking at me going like pick me up pick me up play me play me like. Wow. But it's funny because I I was sure that I was gonna play something really nice, but man, when I hit that thing, it sounded like just a dead cat. It's it sounded like the worst thing you ever heard. Like wow. It didn't. I, I was hoping it would come out, and everybody would be like, "Wow, this is the most beautiful note I ever heard." Now, got done on my ass down the stairs. Dude. Like, <laughs> I was just saying, have you ever played it with a bow before? Never. Oh <laughs> well, no wonder. <laughs> I was gonna get my. I was gonna get my Jimmy Page cashmere on. Oh, I got like, gotcha. you. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a cello years ago that was my great 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 grandfather's, and it got it got brought back into the family, and I ended up with it. And I sat down with this thing, man. It <laughs> it's the bow, man. That. That's an art in itself. It's tough. You think you think you play guitar all these years, like okay, it's a stringed instrument. I can play that. Like no, right, right, right. no, <laughs> no. You, you can, can finger I mean, it. I can probably play the fret easy, but like it's something about the way that Above. that horse hair, it, the way it's it's something to do with. It has a lot to do with friction and and uh, tonality and all this stuff. So yeah. So tell me a about hard lesson learned. Tell me about uh, what I mean. You, you talked about Omar a little bit. What's going on with Alex? Alex is a. Uh, Alex is the director of the School of Rock, uh, uh, which is a you know national chain here. The School of Rock, which everybody, I mean, you don't have to look too far to know what that's about. It's sure. just like the movie. Uh, basically, they they it's a cool thing uh, that where they you know it's a it's a full blown school, full funding, fully legit. It's not like just some little. I mean, they, they, these are huge uh, buildings and operations that they build in cities everywhere around the nation. Alex is the the, the director for the Texas. Uh, School of Rocks, and they they run many of them here. And there's one in Round Rock. There's one here in Southwest. There's one in, uh, down in New Braunfels, and you know, and they're building one in Dallas and Houston, blah blah. So Alec, he's got his hands full with that. Uh, um, he's the director. I mean, it, it's a, it's a beautiful thing because they're you know it's you know as you know um, school you know music in schools has kind of been the budget's been shaved on all that stuff, and it's not like we had when we were young. We had band and. We had jazz band, pep band, you know, symphonic band. They, they don't have any of that. If, if school has any kind of band, it's like, it's just like, we got one band that does it all. <laughs> I hope you like it. And it's like, it, it, we don't, they don't have all these programs that we used to have. So the School of Rock is kind of that, you can go, it's just like school that we have, they have a cafeteria. And I say we because I'm, I'm one of the teachers too, but I haven't been able to go because of the pandemic. And that's the unfortunate thing. Right now, they're all kind of in a freeze too, because the appeal of School of Rock is, the kids come into school, they learn, like, say, if you're a guitar player, bass player, what they do is they, you can learn whatever you want, but then they, they tell you, okay, learn three of these songs, pick three, and then what they do is once they get those songs learned, they go to the big room and they get all the people, all that separate instrumentalists to play the songs together. And now, like, within a month, the kid is, like, now jamming in a band, a full-on band, playing cool songs like Crazy Train, and, you know, of course, they all learn Seven Nation Army and all that, but, uh, you know, and then they have a concert. We have a concert and at a, at a club, and all the, it's packed. And all, you know, they get the whole rock star experience, and hopefully they get the bug. And uh, you know, so Alex has been doing that for about five years now. And then he also is a lead singer of a band called Dead Love Club. He was it was crazy because we all grew up on rock, and he did too. But somewhere around like the early two thousands, he got really into like that whole uh, you know, not my bag, but he got into that whole Euro. New Wave, you know, the Depeche Mode and the Fugazi and the Skinny Puppy and all that. That's cool, and I dig it. And it, 
his band is kind of an electro punk dance thing and uh they're really damn good i mean they're, they're good uh so he's making a record and he's the lead singer in that band he's not the drummer i was gonna say he's not playing drums yeah yeah he's, he, i think he's done playing drums I'm not saying I mean, he plays drums in vallejo but his hands are kind of beat up and i think he's just you know he's just more interested his high his new high now is 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 music and directing and, and like we're, we're all kind of you know we're really immersed in the music business here so it, I, it's something that i see you know us doing very well uh you know for years to come so and we'll still play you know yeah i was gonna say so the blejos are are not over over no never i mean as long as we're all three still here on earth we'll we'll still play we're actually playing in september lord willing if we don't get uh, you know if that if we can get, get out by then but we, we'll be playing with joan jett at uh you know at a big amphitheater here in uh, last week of september so and you said you know in an earlier part we were talking before about coming back to birmingham to play yeah kind of reiterate we, what that was about yeah we we had i mean it was like we were talking it was we were started talking uh i was talking to stephen hanks some more time around we went back and forth and uh and then even bobby daniels and we talked about a vallejo slick lily reunion and we're gonna get burgos malo guys our friends uh, they were so uh, they're all scattered around there too uh yeah sure and they do a big rock show at work play and there was so much interest in it we were even talking about we were prepared to do two shows <clears throat> and then uh and not so much it kind of we put it on hold for a second and then we were like let's go back when the new year starts and we'll, we'll make it a real thing and we'll, we'll do something in the summer and then obviously march showed up we and we started late february we started talking about it and then uh, uh, one of the guys from Workplay was like, hold on. And he, I guess he had, there's always a guy that has like more info that knows more than, about that than we do. Like, he was like, uh, we, they're, they're, we might have some problems. We might not, you know, we might all be shut down here in June. And we were, back then, by then, we were like, nah, dude, that, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. You know? sure. <laughs> here we are. Here we are. <laughs> here we are talking on, on, on Skype. <laughs> Probably going to be another six months. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, man. It's like it's but, tor- uh, it's torture. But if we can get out again, man, we, you know, if we, and, and it, like I, like we talked about, that that wouldn't be, you know, to, we're hoping because that would be a big full show. So, but if we did something, if we did that, which we would love to do it, it'll be when it will hopefully be when we can all get together, you know, in in a packed room again, not socially distancing, you know. Sure. <laughs> We'd have to do six shows to get to entertain four hundred people. <laughs> so I, I I get to tell a story. About, All right. about about you. You ready? All right. <laughs> All right. We're, I'm, I'm, uh, we're playing this club called Rock Shop. It was called something before. What was it called? Rock Connection, no. No, Rock Connect. Yeah, Rock Connection. Because it was Rockingham and Rock Connection. Yeah, Rock Connection. Rock Connection, yeah. and it was called Rock Shop later. And Vallejo's playing, and I'm in the audience, and we're all drinking like crazy, and and th- that place is really tight, you know, low ceilings, yeah. and it had this wooden stuff up here where you could like it was like a false ceiling. <laughs> and, and you're up there, and you grab a hold of this thing, and you're only what five three? <laughs> yeah, five four. Five, four. <laughs> five, four. With and, boots. <laughs> you, and you're hanging off this off the ceiling, right? And you're probably, <laughs> I mean, you're probably four foot off the ground. Yeah. At this point, I don't know how you got up there, but anyway, you're up there hanging, and you're hanging, and you're swinging, and that bitch <laughs> breaks. That piece of wood that you're hanging on breaks, and you just fall and slap right in the middle of the stage. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I dude, like, I, dude I, you know it's funny. I, I did so much of that crazy crap through the '90s. I don't remember that. Like, I mean, I don't. Really? But I, 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 that may, that sounds like totally something I would do. You, you were know? totally hanging there, and all of a sudden the whole thing just came loose, and you land in the middle of the thing. It was, dude, that's funny, dude. <laughs> that, that 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 rock connection was crazy. One time, Scotty O, Alex was like, Alex made the mistake of telling he made Scotty O made Alex a drink, and Alex went back and went, "This drink is weak and sucks." Like Alex, Alex like Scotty goes, "Really?" He grabbed him by the hair, pulled his head back, and just took a bottle of tequila and just poured it down his throat. Yeah. And then just he went like, get out of my face. <laughs> we get back. We, we were taking a break. We get back. Alex is like, he was so hammered, he, he couldn't even play. This yeah. is the first song. I turn back around and look at him, and I try to go back and sing my lines. All of a sudden, I hear, I see the lights do some stuff like that. Alex fell back, and there was a light tree behind him. Pull the lights down, everything, and show's over. Like, done. Like, and then, for the first know, song. <laughs> yeah, day four is like, Y'all can't, y'all are getting, you know, y'all can't be coming in here in my club playing, getting drunk. And I go, hey man, I'm not trying to blame anybody. 
but Scotty O did he poured a <laughs> bottle of tequila down Alex's throat. Like, so they, he, he got in trouble for that. But you know, and I, dude, honestly, I don't think we were even like our age. I think we were like eighteen or nineteen years old. Yeah, so like, everybody was. It was pretty wild not, back then. <laughs> not get <laughs> biz. Wild back there in those places, man. I tell you what, dude. I, ro- dude the one the Rockingham Palace, man. Woo. Yeah. We had, good, there. we had good oh. times there, bro. I know. We would switch off on the stages. That was so fun, too. That was so cool. And it, the fact that, like, I mean, it didn't close till five or six. It's insane to me. Like, I mean, yeah, like, play, it's uh, so crazy. Okay. You could, like, literally be like, you know what? I can't sleep. Wake up at three or four in the morning and go catch a set by Pirate. <laughs> right. and, like, and, like, and the place is bumping. My dad's like, my dad was like, when y'all playing tonight? Oh, we're playing our sets at three. <laughs> three? Is anybody going to be there? It's going to be packed. Like, like he, he never got that. And then one night he he couldn't sleep and he was like, told my mom, I'm gonna go see the boys. And he, he went there and he was like looking around like, this is nuts, dude. Right. <laughs> he, he was like, this is like, uh, this is freaking like bedlam over here. Dude. It was like norms, you know. Norms used to have what one one a.m. start. <laughs> crazy man right. you'd open the door outside because they had it all blacked out and you'd open the door to be sunlight and you'd be like whoa yeah, like, ah, yeah. Right. your head's hurting vampires right that's it's crazy nuts, so tell me about your your newest thing Brody Lane uh, Brody Lane well dude it's crazy because so working with uh, you know uh, this label that I work with 10X we we, we sign a text so a lot of people that like say if you, they don't live in Texas Texas country is its own genre and that it has its own radio stations, its own formats, its own charts. I mean, these guys are these guys are riding around in Van Hools and making twenty, thirty grand a night. This a big, it's a big business. Uh, this Texas country uh, music here. Okay. Um, and they never leave the state, and because here and the thing about Texas is there's about a hundred, I would say a hundred and seventy to a hundred eighty cities and towns, all with clubs, all with music scenes, all with venues. 170 180 active venues you can perform anything as small as like the nick all the way up to you know iron city or whatever y'all got over there like yeah. so a texas artist can go and play all these places and make you know and, and never leave the state and and go play a bunch of money and, and that, that's kind of even not even so much texas country vallejo did it that's why everybody was like why don't y'all come back to birmingham it's like we can't even get out of texas because we, we're so solid booked you, know, sure. you got not only Houston, Dallas, you know San Antonio, Lubbock, El Paso, you know Amarillo. I mean, these those are the big towns. In between all those cities are towns that are the size of Alabaster. You know, what I mean, which are big towns. You have have a big population mm-hmm. that you can go and play a venue and go put four or five hundred people in a city like Alabaster on your way to Houston. So, um, you know, and make a, a really good money. You know, so like, why would you go cross the state line and go play? In, you know, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, you know, like, man, we'll give you 500 bucks versus the door. Like, dude, we make like $10,000 here. Like, why would we, go? <laughs> why would we do that? Right. Well, yeah, it all comes down to just whether, you know, it's worth doing. Yeah. So, but, you know. so that, that's kind of what, so that, I mean, that, that goes for every genre here, but no more, uh, nobody's doing as business as big as Texas country is that they're just, these guys are just, they're just raking it. It's a, and it's a cool genre. It's, it's, it's it's the anti Nashville movement. It's like they hate Nashville. They don't like that pop stuff. They don't you don't dare. Don't you dare. They kind of they they worship at the altar of of course Willie Nelson, who's still our god, and and, the, and technically the you know the governor, the, the unofficial <laughs> governor of us. We don't listen to it. We like <laughs> Willie said they might be cool. We would listen to Willie, right. and then, you know Merle Haggard and all everybody else, and you know Will and Jennings and all that. So and of course uh, uh, you know there's all the town bands, ants, and all those guys that we all. But that's kind of what. That's what it is. It's it's anti pop, anti Nashville. They don't. You better not put no drum machines in there. You better not put. It's, we we still think the fiddle's cool. Nashville doesn't like. Um, so I started producing a lot of that stuff, becoming the producer. So next thing I know, I find myself producing a lot of Texas country. And it's when it, when I started producing about ten years ago, the past five years, it was very two steppy country. But now. It's gotten really saturated because everybody's trying to do it. Uh, it's kind of gotten a little more. They're adding more guitars and a little more rock. And now, it's just southern. It's what we know. What we've always known is southern. We call it southern rock. It's brother brother Kane right now could be Texas country in here here. Yeah, so, yeah. 
I didn't I didn't see myself. I was like, you know, I like, like get on get in on some of this, but I didn't see myself as, um, you know, I love country music, but like I'm a rocker, so I didn't want to go. I wasn't ready to go that go into that yet. But then now there's Whiskey Myers and Cole Wetzel. These are all bands that are like Southern rock that that smell more like Brother Kane meets Black Crows meets, you know, maybe a little Bruce Springsteen thrown in there. So that's when I was kind of like, you know, I like this, you know. So some of that bled into my music, and then. Then I started playing with these these kind of all these cats that are kind of you know big honchos in the scene you know they were in all these big bands so I put together kind of made a little super group and uh, when we started playing and damn and now we're just having a good time rocking and it smells like there's some Vallejoisms because it's me singing of course but it has some Vallejo groove stuff and then but then it sounds like there's some Brother Kane in there because there's just a lot of stuff that I grew up listening to you know there's some Skinner in there and. You know, a lot of Tom Petty. I love Tom Petty, so I, I showed you some of that. You, you yeah, hear, I listened you know. to it. The production was great, man. Yeah, so um, you know, and that's kind of that's kind of what I'm feeling right now. And it, it, it I put it kind of on the back burner because I was doing Love and Chaos a lot. We were playing a lot. Love and Chaos was kind of getting a lot of traction, and Kendall and I were playing a lot. And then Vallejo was still doing their thing. And then obviously covers. You know, covers makes a lot of money. So sure. and then of course the Prince thing. Yeah, tell me about the Prince thing. I mean, you've been doing that, and and you know this is. A, you know, you're sort of responsible for me doing this retro rock revival thing because <laughs> we had talked, you know, I don't know, we talked a year or two ago about the tribute scene. Yeah. And we were talking about that particular thing. And, you know, when I first, I did it as sort of a one-off with one of my other bands. Yeah. But when I realized people really dug it. and They love it. They love the nostalgia. And, and then the fact that, wow, man, it, it is an event you know, and we had something to look forward to as opposed to just our standard thing every day. Yeah. It was something to look forward to. So I'm sure that's sort of what the Prince thing is to you, right? Uh, yeah, man. I mean, people show up dressed in purple and the girls are wearing the Madonna gloves. I mean, they're, they 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 want to relive the 80s. Yeah. And and they sing along every word. And yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, they, they you even kind of, it's, it's kind of a weird, it's kind of surreal because you're up there doing your Prince things and I'm in high heels and they're looking at me like, they, I, I can tell, they're looking at me like, that's the closest thing we got, that's Prince. You know, like, right. like, like, so like, yeah, they get caught up in it, man. And, and and I started, I did it at first kind of just because I love Prince and then, uh, you know, then then you start realizing how much money you can make. The money's sure. just insane. And, and I kind of, I, I turned down probably more than I'd take because I could do it, but I, what I didn't want to become was I didn't want to be just a, a Prince impersonator because if I really wanted to take all the gigs that got offered to us, I, I, I would basically just be doing Prince. I would be a Prince impersonator, and that's not what I was put on this earth to do. Sure. I do love Prince. So then I just started doing, like, hand-selecting things, and, you know, now with the pandemic, it made, made me just go, you know what, can't do the Prince thing because obviously that's the cover thing, and then I can't do Love and Chaos because Kendall's kind of now – they you know they got a house in Utah so they're kind of staying up there for the summer and then uh you know Vallejo's obviously all our gigs kind of went away I think we got one with Joan Jett hope that didn't go away and then you know I'm at home I'm like you know what can I do so me and Bruce Bruce is in the band of course and I got all the guys that we all live around here and the band's called Brody Lane because we all live there's a street here called Brody Lane we all live on Brody Lane oh yeah that's, that's why it's called Brody Lane okay cool. so uh um yeah so man we just started jamming and that's kind of what that's what I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling Brody Lane. So and it's fun. It's just it's going back to being a band again because I, I was doing the solo thing, the AJ thing, and you know it's cool being a solo artist. But like I just something cool about being in a I just, I just like being in a band again. Like you know yeah. so yeah, bands are cool. I mean you know that's like yeah. it's 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 sometimes a pain in the ass and, and frustrating because you have to yeah. you have to you know you ha you have to learn to compromise with each other and it's difficult yeah there's definite democracy going on you know, well like you that. know it's difficult and then you got to keep everybody on the same path and keep things going in the right direction yeah and that's that's hard sometimes but but there is a, a thing that happens with a band that's that's different you know what i mean yeah when, when everybody I mean, yeah I mean, you, I mean you know you you got your studio and they're like you know you make a solo song or record it's like you're just like okay i think it's great next like there's nobody to bounce it off. To, you know, somebody be like, you know what? That's cool, but like that bridge, eh, you know, like there's nobody to tell you that. Like, right, right, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's but, um, you know, also just the chemistry of just the way you know another drummer plays or just another guitar, you know, the ways just the way they hear the song and the way they interpret the song. I think it's just really cool, and you know, I, I think you know, 
the Brody Lane thing is something that I feel is very relevant to what's happening in like what that sound is is exactly what's happening in Texas right now. So I'm I'm really happy to be kind of immersed in that right now. So that's killer. You know, take it back. Let's take it back to uh, to the very beginning again. Back yeah. to you and you and I are kids. And this is funny. I, I one of the stories I, I think of when I think of you guys is I ran sound for you guys a couple of times. Oh really? But, yeah. I, think I might you know what I, I think I kind of remember that. I just Wait. don't. I just always kind of. I just always equated you with either Music Alley or being on stage. <laughs> right, right. Well, one of the things that we did, you came over to my apartment, we put together an intro, you know, an intro thing with a bunch of sound effects. And this, stuff. That, now that I remember, we had the, <laughs> blah, 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 we were trying to make it cool, like, yeah, I remember that. Remember doing that? Well, yeah. I remember doing the, uh, I was running sound at, it used to be an old movie theater, I forgot what it was, it was a picture show or something in Vestavia. And you guys were playing, and I ran sound, and they, we had that soundtrack going. And I, yeah, I didn't do it many times because I was playing, yeah. you know, like you, yeah, yeah. you said. So I didn't run sound a lot, but when I, you know, I would do it here and there. Yeah, but yeah, I remember that. We were in my apartment, you know. This is like in the very beginning. I didn't yeah. have shit. I had a four track, you know. I had a yeah. Keyboard, you and know. I think we were trying to like we were even. I think we were bouncing tracks and stuff to try to add more stuff to it. Yeah, so. it's amazing, right? Okay, I mean, yeah, think, think about it. When we started out, what the technology? I mean, even though our consoles are a little bit older in you know today's standards. I mean, think about what we started with, dude. Dude, I, dude here's the funny thing: it, it was either you, I think it was you or Jamie. One of you, one of y'all two, or probably collectively, I don't know who was getting the commission on that day. Y'all sold us a BS eight eighty Tascam. Okay. Uh, it was either you or Jamie. It wasn't I'll nobody be, else. Probably one of you guys. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and dude, we went on to use that thing even when we moved here, because and there was other technology happening, but we were just so good at it and bouncing tracks that we ended up. Uh, there's some stuff that there's some tracks that ended up on the Beautiful Life album. That that song that uh, HBO played, the Snake in the Grass, that they, that, that uh, True Blood was playing, that was recorded on that Tascam. That we you know it was just beats and guitars we had and stuff. But uh, we, Alex Alex still has it because he's you know he's not interested in, like in this stuff like Owen Ol- and I are. Right. Uh, I finally just just a brotherly love. I finally gave because I have a backup Pro Tools setup. Uh, he's just like literally last year, he was still fucking with that task cam. I go, man, <laughs> put that thing to bed. And like, I was like, I will go. I was like, man, I'll go home. I'll go over there and set you up a thing. And you know, since he's doing the more the electro electro oh, thing, you know, right. he's he does he does a lot of Ableton and uh, but you know, he's he records on Pro Tools and sends me the tracks and I mix them. But uh, yeah, dude, that thing. Kudos to task cam. That thing is still works. Like you can still hit the button and it, you can still record stuff on it. And, and I mean, the buttons are off. Some buttons are missing and stuff. Right. <laughs> it's amazing, right, man? It's like it's like a time machine, dude. Yeah. You know, you know what's crazy? You probably remember this. What's that? Now, now we have auto. Thank God we have auto saving every, on everything. You know, right. after a few minutes. That thing, dude. We'd record six hours. Somebody would be, you know, all drunk or something, and hit the cord and pull it out, and we'd lose everything. You know, because you, you'd have to hit like. Shift, save, you know, <laughs> right? You know, hit a few times to make sure it's saved. Like, right. But yeah, we dude, there was so many lost recordings where some idiot like, oh man, you fucking you know, kill you. you dude. Like, <laughs> know that? How, how many recordings have you lost? Just just not saving stuff. Dude. Oh man, you know what? It was after uh, after my four track, I went to a Fostex R8, so I had you know the reel to reel. Yeah. And I did that, and then I ended up on Pro Tools. Jamie sold me my first Pro Tools rig. <laughs> I still have it underneath my desk here, but it, I don't. I mean, it still works, but I don't use yeah. it. And uh, yeah, man. Ever since I've been like uh, digital, but yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's so much better, man. Even my live stuff, my live console records to an SD card now. Oh wow! Cool. You know, even I, in okay. fact, this thing I'm using right here, it's got a, a, a USB drive, and I can record yeah. 24 tracks to it live. You know, it's like yeah. Oh, dude, but I remember, I remember back like even in the '90s, I'm like, man, one of these days we're gonna be able to like tune vocals, or one of these days we're gonna be able to like take a song and like slow the tempo down without changing the, you know. The, sure. Here we are. We're, we're here. We're like, doing it. Yeah. Like, that's funny. You, my friends are like, dude, that's never gonna happen, dude. Like, <laughs> that's funny you said about talked about Barriero because uh, Steve Thompson, his partner, is supposed to yeah. be on, is supposed to be on here with me at some oh, point. Cool. We're gonna talk about GNR and and uh, all that stuff. So. Yeah, well, Steve, let, let him know, dude. Say yeah, that, that, uh, one of Michael's, and it, it'd be—I mean, it'd be interesting to ask him 
uh, you know, if him and Michael talk or what their relationship is now, because right. I, I never, we never talked much about it. But when I think I named, I think when I brought his name up, he, he didn't say anything bad. He just kind of like, he didn't want to talk. He didn't want to talk about it. You know, so. Oh, yeah. That was, that was 10 years ago. Uh, no, it's now 20 years ago. Yeah, 2020. That was 20 years ago. So Yeah, yeah. Steve Steve and Michael did uh, so many records that we grew up on, you know, the, the g and R record. Good. Doc, yeah. and Doc and Ingve, they did all kinds of. Uh, they did all uh, those records. Tesla, and, they, and, they, and they, dude, they even did a what do you call it? Some the Maroon, the first Maroon Five album. Like nobody, a lot of people don't know that. I didn't like, know they that. Did that. Wow, it's I didn't crazy. Know that. Yeah, yeah. I have to I have to look at that one. Yeah, it's a great album. I've got it over on vinyl. I rebought it on vinyl. Oh, uh, the songs about Jane. Yeah, yeah, it's a good record, man. Yeah, have you, have you, have you, I mean, everything. I mean. They're cool. I don't hate on them because they they're definitely a part of a pop machine. But like that first record, man, is just it's perfect. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, beginning to end, you know. Yeah, it's a great album, but, man. You so say, and, I think, and I think if you look at it, maybe uh, maybe Steve is on one or two of the songs. That's kind of where they had a falling out. Okay. Uh, I think I think because Steve wasn't interested. He's like, man, I'm not going. You know, and, you know. I think Michael was like, hey, dude, this 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 is where music's going. And I think Steve was like. I don't want no part of it. You know, like that yeah. dude, that they're trying to do Michael Jackson with the guitars on. No, I don't want it. Right, <laughs> like, right. That he may have done a song or two, but I want to say he did "Harder to Breathe." But that's where they kind of like parted Separate. ways. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so man, I really appreciate you catching up, man. It's been yeah, man, for sure, dude. It's a pleasure talking to you. Catch and catching up, dude. It's like I, I do a lot of these, and it's like most of they're like, "Hey, man, so tell me about you." Like. We're just catching up here. That's right, all. right, right. And letting Birmingham watch or whoever. Yeah, yeah, you know, the Birmingham yeah, yeah. people were excited. I saw a bunch of people talking about, you know, Carol Marshall. She said that, and I, I didn't even realize we had her in common, you know, after all these years. So yeah. funny, you know. It's funny because I thought, I, I, for, I heard, I, for some reason, I thought about her, like not in a weird way, but I just heard we talked about her, and we, she played basketball with us. She was kind of a tomboy, and uh -huh. we, she came up about just like two or three months ago, like in a conversation, and we talked about how then she went, she went, they went to like. Georgia or something for the summer, and then when she came back and at the bus stop, she looked different. We were like, <laughs> right. "Whoa, she looked really good!" Like we were like, "That's a okay." Yeah, her, bro out. her brother was a her, her brother was a wild man. He was one of our good buddies, and uh, it, Doug. You know what, I, we remember that he, he was a wild man. Doug, so. right? He was always in always in trouble, man, and I <laughs> yeah. was always hanging on trying try not to get killed. <laughs> Because he was so wild, man. It's, dude, it's, dude, it's amazing. We're all still alive. You know, knock on wood. We're all still alive after that. I mean, this Alabama, that was, I'm glad I grew up there, man, because we, we had some crazy, crazy times, man. Crazy good crazy. times, right? Yeah, man. Well, tell your well, brother. Cool, man. Thanks, bro. Tell me, tell your brothers I said, hey. For sure, man. I will. I'll let them know. And I'll tell, I'll tell they'll, they'll watch. I'm sure that my whole, I'm going to send my family to watch all this. So, okay. Uh, well, I'll dude, definitely, uh, if you guys get back to town, I'll definitely uh, come, try to make that. No, for sure, dude. I mean, and, it, it, I'm, I'm sure if we get down there, it'll be, we'll make a big deal out of it. So, yeah. And then, um, you know, I still want to come out and hang with you in Austin and see what it's dude, all about. You come, dude. But when it opens up, dude, I'm just telling you, it's like adult Disneyland here, dude. It's, it's uh, <laughs> I, you know, when I first came here, I loved, you know, I loved uh, everything that, Alabama did for us and all the history we have there but when I came here I just fell in love with the place I mean immediately just like I was like I belong here you know like because it's and you know I'm just really happy and I love I love it here but you know but I do miss I miss Alabama it's just like it's been a long time you know I mean I, it's been uh man it's been a couple of years since I've been here so yeah. can't wait to get back well I'll uh, try to catch up with you soon and uh you just yeah, man, keep on sure. rocking we'll get through this thing Get back out there and do our thing. And, uh, All right, man. Thing. Keep on rocking yourself, dude. I look forward to the next arrival. So. We were playing, supposed to be playing Saturday, so we'll see. <laughs> All right, dude. All right, man. I'll All see right, you. Peace. See you, buddy. Bye-bye.